afternoon to this empowering teaching excellence faculty, Sam Menar. My name is Rob for WAG. Uh, Executive Vice Provost and Dean of Academic and Instructional Services. Let me just give you a quick background about Empowering Teaching Excellence and that brand and that editor. Uh, some of you might know this uh, a series of work uh, uh, shops that will be doing this. Uh, all was previously called the Provost Series on Instructional Excellence. And um, uh, Academic and Instructional Serve, this has been very pleased to uh, take on the um, responsibility of pro providing faculty development opportunities for um, all of the USU system across the estate. Uh, you might have heard the term empowering teaching excellence before that's the name of a faculty conference that we do in August. Uh, it's also the a term that we um, um, use for a foundations workshop for all uh, new faculty. So you can see we're starting to brand this ETE brand, this <clears throat> Empowering te uh, Teaching Excellence, then with several different events that are associated with it. One of the types will, will be the uh, series of faculty seminars that we will be doing during fall and spring uh, s s s semesters. We'll be doing it here on the Logan campus. It will be broadcast all across of the estate. So I'm pleased to welcome uh, all faculty here on the Logan campus, as well as faculty and staff that might be uh, uh, connected from a regional campus as, as well as USU Eastern. Uh, just wanted to make um, you aware that this is the first of three faculty seminars that we'll be conducting <clears throat> during fall semester. Uh, the uh, next faculty seminar will be held on October 28th. And then the third one will be held on November 17th. We are in the process now of creating an ETE web page that will then be able to link out to all of the different ETE events that are sponsored by the uh, provost office and AIS. And, and so we'll be placed and we'll let you uh, know as soon as that website goes, go, goes alive. Uh, we have an excellent uh, uh, pro program set up for to, uh, to today. What's really neat about this job, can I just say, is, is that over the course of the academic year, you will see we will bring in some outside speakers. But what I'm really excited about is that we don't have to, uh, because we have great faculty here. And uh, <clears throat> faculty who are doing innovative and really exciting things. And, and, and that's what's so neat with the responsibility that I have, is, is to discuss and talk and discover uh, all of the different things that um, faculty are doing out across the estate. So we have three examples of that this afternoon. What I'm going to uh, do is we're going to split our uh, this seminar up into three uh, third three thirty minute parts. I will introduce each uh, speaker, give a short bio and description of what they're going to be talking about, and then I'll sit. And when they're when the first one's done, I'll get up and do that a second time, rather than going through three bios really quick and three descriptions. So our first uh, speaker, faculty speaker, is uh, Jen Evers, and Jen is actually uh, will be connecting from our Moab campus, and we're very excited about that and her presentation will be here we have our overhead microphones so when it comes time for questions and answers feel free to ask um, Jen questions Jen will work as a mental health mental health therapist working with kids with serious emotional disturbance for five years until an opening at the Moab campus allowed an opportunity to um, return to a place she l -l -l loves. That was in September 2013. She is currently a clinical assistant professor in social work and teaches a variety of courses, including human behavior in the social environment, field practicum, mental health, social welfare policy, community practice, and a few others. She also maintains a small private practice serving the small community of Moab. When she isn't in an office setting, Jan is usually enjoying the beautiful outdoors surrounding 
Moab. And her presentation is described as follows. After attending a city workshop on flipping the classroom, Jen saw an opportunity to, to um, implement layered curriculum in her broadcast course. While still working out some of the kinks in Canvas, Jen has initially enjoyed that the design forces students to take individual accountability for their own learning and provides student choice for, for uh, assignments. In this presentation, she will take us on her path from inspiration to implementation. So, so Jen will take about 20 minutes for her presentation, and then we'll reserve about 10 minutes at the end for questions and answers. So I turn the time over to Jen Evers. That intro. Um, as Robert said, that uh, I did get very excited about the possibility of uh, implementing something that I have really wanted to do since I started uh, working at USU. And that is that uh, differentiated learning piece. Um, I've spoken with many other professors on, you know, ways that they might be doing that. And it's always been a big uh, draw for me. So it really um, resonated with me when uh, Travis was talking about the layered curriculum and his flipping the classroom presentation. I think that was just in the spring. Um, so I am going to talk today about um, what the layered curriculum is, uh, how I have implemented it, what it's based on, some of the research, um, and uh, talk about how it's going so far. It's very new. Obviously, we're pretty early in the semester at this point, and I by no means consider myself an expert on this, but I am already realizing some really great benefits of implementing the layered curriculum, and then just a few little um, minor modifications that I've had to make to the course as I had it. Um, okay, so uh, I mentioned that this resonated with me because of the differentiated learning piece, but it also resonated with me because I don't know about other disciplines, but in the social work discipline, and really, I mean, the, the course I implemented it in was the Human Behavior in the Social Environment course, which is a 2100 level course, I have the sense that students expect an A. You know, they, they feel that by doing the assignments, that, you know, they're sort of jumping through hoops and expect an A. And one thing I really liked about this is it's very clear about um, what demonstrates competence and what demonstrates excellence. Um, so I was very excited. Uh, to have Travis's support in attempting this. Uh, I promised him and followed through on contacting him regarding his layered curriculum present, well, his engaging students flipping the classroom presentation. I just latched on to the layered curriculum piece. Um, and uh, he and Aaron uh, from the CD folks uh, were extremely instrumental in helping me do this. In fact, I don't think that I would have hazarded it without some of their um, guidance and support suggestions. We did some brainstorming together to decide what to include. So really, the layered curriculum um, is a teaching method that builds on students' varied learning styles and multiple intelligences. I don't know if everybody knows that word or if it's a social worky term, the multiple intelligences, but Suffice it to say that people learn differently. They have different strengths when it comes to really anything. So um, my goal is really to help the students make meaning of what they're reading in a book or whatever materials I provide to them and relating that to the real world. So I want them to begin to apply it and think critically about it. Um, one of the key elements of this method is to match students with activities that best fit their learning needs instead of just focusing on one specific type of activity and assigning it to everyone. They're, they kind of have the option of selecting what they feel will, you know, fit them best. Um, integrating a layered curriculum uh, also allows for the differentiated learning, uh, which can be very 
uh, motivating and engaging for students. They can um, definitely feel more empowered in a student-centered classroom that way. Um, okay, so this is founded on um, Bloom's taxonomy. And you can see here that the bottom layer is essentially basic knowledge. And the thing I think of when I hear that and, and consider the C layer is kind of information regurgitation, right? It demonstrates the ability to remember what they learned. They can um, talk about what they read, uh, remember it, but there may not be more beyond that when we're talking about the C layer, okay? And these layers are associated with grades. So C layer, competence, they know what they read, they can remember what they read. Okay, that's a very, I think, potentially minimal description of competence, but it's a, it's a minimum of what we would expect, right? Um, then we move up to the B layer, and that layer represents understanding. So understanding the information that they have read or that's been presented to them, and it uh, allows us to assess how well the student can explain the ideas uh, and the information that's been presented to them and, and use it in a different way than they have before. Um, so for a student to be able to explain something, they obviously need to have a, a better uh, grasp on it than simple regurgitation. So then we move up to the A layer. And this layer requires students to really synthesize information uh, and demonstrate the ability to think critically about it. Uh, that was a really big piece for me as well, a big draw for the layered curriculum, um, was that critical thinking part. Um, in my teaching philosophy, I talk about how important uh, facilitating critical thought is, and, and I have been um, very excited to find a method of demonstrating my attempts to do this through my teaching. Um, so when we're talking about critical thinking, we're asking students to consider what they've read or heard um, through the materials offered for the class. Can they offer a different point of view? Are they able to recognize things like bias? I always have students um, consider bias. I love it when a student will include information about the textbook that is critical not because I want them to trash the book, but because I want them to be thinking critically about information that is presented to them and be able to discuss that and discuss why they believe that. They, they can justify their point of view. Um, those were all really big pieces for me with implementing this. And now to my layers. So, A very critical piece of this um, curriculum is that students must complete each layer before moving on to the next, which stands to reason. We don't uh, let students who don't understand something start applying it, right? It would be pandemonium. So they have to complete the requirements of the C layer before they are allowed to do the B layer assignments. So the information is very explicitly conveyed as building on each uh, piece of information that they get, right? So the requirements for the C layer, I included a learning contract pretest, and I call a syllabus a learning contract because I think that it puts the onus on the student. And I state that when they complete the learning contract quiz that it is an understanding between the student and myself about the expectations in the course. Uh, the, con the contract quiz is open book, it's on Canvas. They can take it as many times as they like. I require them to get 100 on it. I want them to know that document and I can tell you, I have had way fewer questions about what is included in assignment. I think that testing them on that piece uh, indicates to them that I expect that they know that information. So if they have a question on it, they tend to go to that. I really want them to know that it's something that has been created for their benefit and that they should utilize it. So I require that at the outset. Uh, the next assignment that is required is uh, in-class activities. 
The HIBC course, Human Behavior and the Social Environment, is a very theoretically based course. And every week we do in-class activities and it takes up a bulk of the class. So they need to have read the information and I'll talk next about the way I hold them accountable for that. Um, but they have to be in the class to do it. And I have taught this class every semester that I've been teaching, except my very first one. And I, you know, I've evolved it a little here and there. Um, but with the layered curriculum, I had to modify a piece that I was pretty set in, which was you have to be in class to do the in-class activities. Well, I think that's a fine standard to have. But if you're doing the layered curriculum, if the students aren't completing all of these, they aren't able to move forward. We have a departmental attendance policy that I feel is in conflict with not allowing them to do that as part of the layered curriculum. So I now have them make it up. They do an independent assignment. I would say it may not be as beneficial as being in class, but there's some accountability there for keeping up with what's going on in the classroom, even when they're not here. The next requirement is weekly quizzes, and that is how I keep students <laughs> accountable for reading. Um, I did reflection papers every week before in all of my classes, and doing reflection papers for three classes every week gets very daunting for grading. And so I am trying quizzes this year, and so far I'm loving it. Um, and it really fits in with that piece of being able to recall information, being able to remember what they read. The weekly quizzes include information straight out of the textbook. They don't apply it. They're just basically demonstrating that they read and understand the material. So I feel very confident about those three items being in this layer. The next two items really could go in a different layer. However, I did not feel that either of them uh, could be unfinished by a student and have the student be competent to move forward. The students in this class are typically taking it as a prerequisite for the social work program. And so they're typically highly motivated. However, in good conscience, I could not leave those out of the C layer because a student could say, oh, I'm going for a C, I don't care. And if they didn't do these two assignments, it would be a big problem as far as Prog progress in the program. So they're included here for that reason. Uh, they are required for competence in the program. The affirming your personal identity paper, um, the students do a lot of self-reflection and self-analyzing. They look at um, the multiple dimensions of human behavior for themselves. And uh, it's my favorite piece. I wish they could write it the very first thing because I learned so much about them in that paper. Uh, the in-class PI activity, PI stands for person in environment, is one we do in class on the last night of class. And that is one in which they take the information we've learned throughout the entire year and apply it to a case. This class is very theory intensive. So that is a very comprehensive assignment and truthfully, could go in the A layer. But again, I could not allow a student to move forward in the program not having done it if they chose to, you know, just go for a C. Frankly, all of the students are pretty motivated to do better than that, and a C wouldn't be a competitive grade for the social work program. It's a pretty competitive application process. But, um, you know, the off chance. I feel like I have to cover my bases and um, it's a bit of gatekeeping as far as getting into the program as well. All right, the um, B layer assignments offer students the opportunity to apply what they have learned. So the reading questions are designed to help students synthesize some information and make connections. Um, I actually flat out stole this from a professor who presented at the August ETE conference, not this academic year, but the last one. He was a philosophy professor, if any of you were there. I loved his reading response questions, and I just use them. I think they're fantastic. It goes from um, regurgitation to that kind of applying and critical thinking piece. 
So the questions are, what was the reading about as a whole? Okay, so nutshelling it, right? That's some regurgitation. Identify and articulate in your own words the important claims in the chapter. So I want them to be able to sort through the information and decide what the critical pieces were. Write a two to three sentence judgment about what you read. So I want to know what they think about what they read, whether it was a theory or anything in the, in the material. Um, and then what is the significance of it? I want them to start thinking critically of, okay, so what? This person wrote a chapter on the psychological person. So is it important and why or why not? And how does that material connect to other ideas, issues, life, other classes? I want them to start making those connections. Okay, and you, you will notice on the B layer, they can choose two of the four options here. So when they do chapter reflection papers, they do one for each section of the book. The book is divided into three. So three papers equals one of the requirements for the B layer. They can also opt to do the uh, midterm quiz or final quiz. And these differ from the weekly quizzes in that, as I said, the weekly quizzes are over material in the text and the midterm and final quizzes are uh, more scenario based and vignette based. So the students have to apply the information that they've learned to get the correct response. Um, you guys will notice I pointed out here that the C layer, they have to complete all of those assignments. And not all layered curriculums are like this. Some have C layers where they can pick. I couldn't <laughs> let go of any one of these really and feel that a student would be competent. So they don't have the option on my C layer, but you can certainly have options in the C layer. And I might in future try to come up with some that would allow students to have more options there. All right, back to the B layer, sorry. We have the chapter reflection papers, midterm final quiz, and the lifespan paper. And this uh, requires students to choose a segment of the lifespan from pregnancy to older adulthood that they're interested in. We talk about human development in this class a bit. And then they spend some time with them and then write a paper that describes the group, you know, demographic information, as well as their impressions of the age group in terms of how they do or do not fit in with the theories around human development. So you can see that's again, applying that information and looking at um, you know, how, how well it fits with real life. All right, and then the A layer assignments, which to me equal excellence, we have competence to excellence here. Um, and they have two options. They pick one of these. They can watch a movie and respond to a list of questions. They, they basically have to utilize a variety, variety of theoretical lenses that they learn in the textbook to better understand the behaviors of the primary character in the movie and his connection to individual functioning, as well as interventions for positive change. So a very critical uh, thinking process is involved and um, analyzing a lot more of the material. The other option is doing a theory comparison paper, and it's exactly what it sounds like. They have to think about the strengths and limitations of two theories that are presented in the book. And to do that, to compare and contrast and to um, explain when they might be applied, they have to really understand them and think about how they will be utilized. So that was what I came up with for my layers. I am very interested in including um, presentations in the B and A layers because I feel that some students, I don't know any of them, but I think some students might like presentations better. Um, I do have two students who are in this class that have taken it before. Um, for whatever reason, they need to retake it. And I have not heard a peep from them about it's harder now or any complaints. So um, I, I don't know how it's shaking out yet as far as the student perspective is concerned. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I was just, you know, um, dancing in the halls when I could say, hey, you know, I've been trying to put some teeth behind this learning contract pretest is required. 
And uh, now, now it has teeth. It's not just this thing that I say and hope nobody calls me on making them take it, right? Students can always choose not to. Um, so I feel like a lot of the pieces of the course that I feel are important are now explicitly important uh, as evidenced by where they fit in the learning contract. Um, the C layer is just as important as the A layer. They have to have that. So I am giving you my contact information. I am happy, again, I'm no expert, but I'm happy to talk with anyone who's interested in considering a layered curriculum. This is the only class I am doing a layered curriculum in at the moment. It's the only one I teach every semester, <laughs> but hopefully in future there will be others because I very much uh, appreciate, you know, all the strengths of it, the student-centeredness, the differentiated um, learning, the accountability. Um, it fits very well for me as a, a teacher, a facilitator of learning. So. Um, thank you guys so much for your attention. I want to say also huge thanks to Aaron and Travis at the USU CD. They were very instrumental in me getting this going. And there are a couple of other resources if you're used to or if you're interested in looking them up. Um, Kathy Nunley has a website for educators and she talks all about uh, layered curriculum and has some examples. And then the Vanderbilt University Center for Teaching. Um, discusses Bloom's, Bloom's taxonomy on which this is all based as well. So questions, comments, suggestions, concerns? Great. Thanks, uh, Jan. Any questions? We have time for maybe just one as we move along. But Jan has offered to respond to any emails or phone calls. Are there are any questions this afternoon? Okay. Question for her, please. What, what if well, a student in layer B can never jump to layer, layer A? How do you deal with that? I'm sorry, what was that? So for some students, they are always in layer B. They, uh, their kind of academic performance can never be in layer A, the highest layer. How do you deal with those students? That's a really great question. I haven't gotten to that point yet. I don't know. That's a, it's really honestly been a learning process as I go along. Like I said, this, you know, the in-class activities and other things that I require them to be in class for, the weekly quizzes even, I've had to say, ah, that's not going to work. And so I'm, I'm learning as I'm going along with this too. So I don't know. Do you have thoughts or ideas on that? I can write them down and save them for when it happens. So with Neil. I have one question. This may be related, but have you run into a situation or how would you approach a situation where maybe a student uh, left off part of the C layer, but maybe completed the B layer or the A layer. Oh, yes. I'm glad you asked that because I have had students, I haven't had students ask me this, but I explicitly stated, if you do not complete all of the C layer, I won't even look at your B layer. I won't even look at it. And students have said, what if I take the midterm quiz and I don't get a good grade? Can I do the lifespan paper? <laughs> I'm fine. If they want to do all four of those things, if they want to practice applying the information until they can really get it, I'm fine with that. I'm going to drop two of their scores, the two lowest scores. They can't count all those points, but they can do those all the B layer and both of the A layer as far as I'm concerned. But yes, I've told them I won't even look at B or A if the other requirements aren't met. They have to build to it because the understanding comes first, application, and then that critical thought and synthesis. Awesome. Great. Well, a big thank you to Jen Nett. Uh, give her a hand, please. And please uh, feel free to contact her. I did say we are recording this, uh, too, and this will be attached to our ETE web site. So we'll be creating quite a library of these uh, presentations. Our second uh, presentation this afternoon will be by David Wall. Dave Vidwal is Assistant Professor of Visual Studies in the Department of Art and D Design. He has taught at numerous colleges and, and um, universities in both the, the um, U.S. and the U.K. Before coming to, and before coming to USU, David was at Indiana University in Bloomington. His 
Um, research focuses on representations of race across the broad landscape of visual culture. And his presentation description is, having recently been through the experience of remodeling a large general education breadth humanities course from face-to-face -to, -face to online, this presentation will focus on the processes of redesigning a course to suit shifting, lear shifting learning environments while maintaining a consistent emphasis on student engagement and learning. And it's my pleasure to introduce David Wall. Is that okay? Whoever needs to test this, is that good? Yeah. Okay, well the first thing is thanks for inviting me. The second thing is, um, I say with no false modesty, whenever there's anything about teaching excellence, I don't feel like I'm particularly qualified to speak. Because in terms of being an excellent teacher, but I have experience, so that's a good thing. Um, and do, doing the, the, the third thing is that it's a good, good lesson never to write your presentation description before you've sorted out your presentation. So we'll be touching on some of those things, but we might not be touching on all of them in exactly that way. Um, but, okay, how do I get... Okay. Um, but what we did just do this past year... We went through. Why won't, why won't this come up? There we go. Oh, there we go. Can we get it onto the. Okay, so we went through this process of, um, as I say, shifting a large gen ed course, what we were teaching. Um, called the Creative Arts, which is generally introduction to the uh, an overview to the arts to mostly freshman students, but by no means all. And it was pretty big. There were nine hundred students on average in the in the fall semester, and, and maybe six or seven hundred in the spring. So there's a lot of people, a lot of bodies. And it was really interesting to think about. Okay, how do we? Because there were so many problems with that, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, how do we sort of shift that to online, and what was the, the sort of rationale behind that? Um, and I was thinking this through, and I was thinking, well, how do you think about what the Canvas classroom is doing, and how do we think in it, and how do we think it, how do we imagine it? Because, of course, it's not just a different classroom, it's an entirely different thing, it's an entirely different experience, right? So, it's not, it, you know, when, when you're doing, going to online, it's not just a question of, of shoving the stuff you would have done there, over there, right? So, anyway, so I was thinking about all that, how, how do we... we think it, how do we think through it? Um, so I've come up with these musings, right? So I don't know how useful they're going to be. But anyway, this is my old classroom, right? Up until recently, this is where we were <laughs> teaching. And it's pretty, it's not daunting particularly, it's just weird, you know? It's a big space and there's a 900 and 1,000 people in there. And as you might expect, there's all sorts of problems with it. There's all sorts of problems with engagement and talking to students, etc., etc. So this led us, every year we would talk about these same things. What are the problems? The students would come up with the same issues in, in, um, in their evaluations all the time about not feeling like they were in a class, not being engaged, not being able to talk to their professor adequately, all, the, all things, and they were absolutely right. You know, we had nothing but sympathy for, for those issues. I've never, I, I took one online class in my life, and I feel a bit ambivalent about them in all sorts of ways, I took one, um, which ironically enough was how to teach an online course. It was not very successful. I didn't enjoy it. I didn't feel like it was particularly useful. But one of the things you're kind of wrestling against, one of the things we're wrestling against, and we heard it in Jen's presentation, and we're going to hear it in mine, and Courtney, and we'll probably hear it in Courtney's, is the, the whole idea of what, what student-centred learning is. Right? So this is what we are wrestling against. This is our nemesis, Thomas Gradgrind, the headmaster from Charles Dickens' Hard Times. And the only thing that Gradgrind was interested in, and these pictures are all different evocations of Gradgrind from over the years, 
That one in the top right is from the 1967 edition of Hard Times, where it's published as a book, and these are different TV versions. The only thing that Gradgrind is interested in is facts. So let me just... Stick to facts, sir. That is your charge here. Girl number 20. Who is that girl? I don't know that girl. Sissy Jim, sir. Sissy is not a name. Don't call yourself Sissy. <coughs> call yourself Cecilia. But his father always calls me Sissy, sir. He always did. Then he has no business to do it. Tell him he mustn't. <laughs> Who is your father? He belongs to Horshine, if you please, sir. We don't know anything of the horse riding here. Don't tell us of that. And tell him there must be no more sissy. Give me your definition of a horse. Girl number 20, unable to define a horse. Girl number 20, possessed of no facts in reference to one of the commonest of animals. Some boy's definition of a horse. Yours. Quadruped, graminivorous, 40 teeth, namely 24 grinders, 4 eye teeth, and 12 incisors. Sheds coal in spring, and in marshy countries, sheds hooves too. Hooves hard and requiring to be shot with iron. A horse, Okay, so why is Grad Grind such a problematic figure? Because he is, um, he's only interested in facts. He's not interested in the children's names. He's interested in definitions. But there's nothing else. He's a sort of the, your, your paradigm of the sort of stern, um, authoritarian father figure. And, of course, Dickens is meant to be portraying like that. Unfortunately, we, we I think, education has become kind of seduced into fear in Gradgrind, when Gradgrind is, of course, a complete caricature. So one of the things that I was thinking about as we go through from... from um, face-to-face to online, but also that kind of crosses those two boundaries. Well, what, what are we trying to do with students in these different environments? So one of the first things, I mean, okay, well, student centre learning. I'm not really 100% sure I know exactly what that means. Like boy, who can give you a definition of a horse, I'm not sure I could give you a definition of student centre learning. There's all sorts of things that we can point to. Um, but the first question is, what's Greg Grind all bad? I mean, was, that, was, was it wrong to demand that our students know stuff, that they know facts? Well, of course it isn't. That's perfectly fine. It's the, process is not, the question is not whether they know facts, it's how we go about kind of thinking about those facts, how they access that information and what that information is used for or the ways in which it was used. So facts are good in all sorts of ways, but they don't, obviously don't equate to knowledge and understanding. And... Um, the boy can give you a definition of a horse, and that's fine for Grant Ryan. He doesn't care about anything else. He doesn't care about context. He doesn't care about feeling or emotion. Everything is simply um, mechanistic and utilitarian. And what's interesting, what, why I was kind of thinking about Grant Ryan's part of this whole process is because in some ways, there's a, there's a kind of... Um, we might think of the online environment as being a kind of less human environment. Because we're not interacting in a day-to-day -day way, in a real way, with other human beings, necessarily. But there must be something. There's, there's obviously a great utility to this. Again, for grad grind, the only things that are valuable are, is stuff that can be measured, which, in our current education environment, is kind of interesting. Because we'd hate to think that we model anything on grad grind. But one of the things that we do know is there are constantly new processes of assessment and measurement that seem to give value to what we are doing. So there's all sorts of kind of interesting things are raised by this. So how can we put information in an environment that students are not interacting with each other on a day-to-day -day basis, or in a real, real basis, we'll say, how can we do that? How can we get through process of assessment and engagement in a way that avoids being kind of grad grind about it, that avoids just asking students to access information and then just repeat it? Um, and again, it's not that that's not important, but we have to do something more than that. So what are we doing with Canvas? You see a picture in the tent. You see what I did there? Canvas and tent. very good. <laughs> anyway, I couldn't come up with anything better. You know, I was late. It was late. 
I was drunk. What can you expect? Okay. So we'll go back to student-centred learning. So like I say, I'm not sure that I have a definition, but we would probably agree on pointing to some of these things, right? So we've got to think about, okay, what is, what's the student doing in this environment? What is their experience? Even though it's difficult in some ways to entirely put yourself in that, what's their experience of that environment? So can we imagine that? So if we can imagine that or try to, then we can imagine, begin to imagine maybe then how they're going to deal with the, everything that's going on. We're going to try and find relevant, interesting material and um, appropriate process for engagement and assessment and all that stuff and space that they can do that. Engagement with other learners and instructors. These are all sort of very bog-standard things. And I think they're, they're things that, generally speaking, um, probably most of us went through in one way or another. The school that I was at when I was at high school, they didn't care about student-centred learning. It meant nothing to them. But learning was student-centred in all sorts of ways. You know, we, we, we all came through unscathed. But anyway, but we're trying to think about how we can do that in these environments. And specifically, how does it work in online environments? So, there are particular problems. I like this cartoon, even though it's really about MOOCs. And it's been 45 minutes, I don't think it's going to call on you. Okay. So, what are... Um, Online issues, these are kind of things that come up again and again. And as I say, I, I feel a little bit ambivalent about online classes in all sorts of ways. However, this, the 1330, is, is perfect as an online experience, I think, in all sorts of ways. I'll get onto that in a second. But here are some sort of issues or problems. Problems with miscommunication, problems with self-discipline. How are we going to make sure that students are doing what they're meant to be doing? Um, and how are they doing those things? It, may, it might make teamwork a little bit more difficult because what you've got is a whole bunch of people in these kind of isolated spaces. How are we going to encourage them or facilitate them working together? There's no class culture. And for good or ill, that's something that's important. Because when we're all in a room together, that's a different experience to us all sitting right now at a computer terminal having this conversation. It may not be better or worse, but it's certainly a different thing. This sort of the Socratic model that really our system is based on has disappeared, certainly within the context of that. There may be technical issues. So some students at some point may not be able to access um, a computer. If in, in, for 1330, there's nothing that is set up where they all have to be in the same space at the same time. But I can see how that might be the feature of some classes. That then might be a potential problem, right? And then the appropriateness of subject matter. So there might be some things that, that is really difficult to do remotely. Um, but a pottery class. If you don't have a wheel at home, then, that, then that's a problem, right? So there might, there may, you can imagine there might be some thing. So those are all issues to think about. But there's also face-to-face -face issues, and we'll go back to my classroom, or my late classroom, and unsurprisingly, it's exactly the same list, right? There's no difference there. The same issues are going to come up. Miscommunication, when you've got 900 people in the room, and you're talking, and there's a whole bunch of people talking with each other over there, and there's a whole bunch of people buying shoes over there, or just coming and going, whatever it might be, again, it's a sort of an odd, it's, you know, it's a, it's a Thousand level course, a hundred level course, thirteen thirty. And one of the things I always would say to them is, like, ironically enough, even though this is really kind of just an introductory course, it's the one space where you have got to be totally self-disciplined. I cannot run around everyone's dorm rooms making sure you're doing all your work. You, you've got to be totally self-motivated to do this. Um, there was no, no options for teamwork. I mean, everything kind of collapses at that at that point, you know, there's no class culture to speak of. Everything that we might identify as problems with online are problems with that face-to-face -face with 900 students. So, having said that, they're different things. They're apples and oranges. They're both fruit, right, but they taste very differently. Not a fascinating, well-thought-out analogy. They're both fruit, but they taste very different. So, again, so, so what can we think about the going through the process of putting this thing online. And again, and Jen mentioned it, and um, 
there's, no, there's nothing I could have done, not one thing could I have done without Arian and Travis and Neil and Ryan, those guys, nothing. So one of the lessons is you are as good or capable as the people that are doing that stuff, and those guys are great, so we, we always have to give them a good, a good shout out. But one of the things that I sort of immediately sort of came to mind was it's about space and time. So you're so rigidly, you know, the parameters of your imagination are so rigidly stuck inside these four walls, literally and metaphorically. And space and time do not pertain in the same way on the web, right? So it's really, I found it really difficult to just stop thinking outside of a sort of physical space and to think about it as a much more kind of diffuse space, a space where they're not all in the same room. They're, they're, they're doing things at different times. You can do all, and that's a kind of liberating thing in all sorts of ways because you're not tied down to having to do things yourself. But it also means, I think, you can think through the opportunities and abilities for students to do things because, of course, they're not tied down in the same way either. What we did with this, and I'll see if I can, in one second, if I can, I tried to put a hyperlink into this, so we'll see if that worked or not. One of the things that we did, this is the, the top there is a, a screenshot of the <coughs> first page, so you get to, it's called Creative Arts, and then at the bottom menu, there's your four modules. Okay. And these modules and, and units I'll talk about in one second, but they're these kind of parcels of engagement, as I like to think of. So they're little spaces for, pe for people to go to. So you click on the art module, and then you've got five different... Well, there's an introduction, an introductory page, and then you've got five different units, and these units are different topics. So the avant-garde, modernism, museums, photography, and then there's a unit on water and art. And the students can choose three out of those five to do. And the way that we sort of ended up setting it up, and again, this was really talking to these guys, um, was that the introductory unit is week one, and then they can do the other three units whenever they want to over the next three weeks. So they have the kind of flexibility in the space to do that. Each module is open for one month and one month only. So we kind of ended up, um, I suppose, you know, kind of giving in to, to the semester in a way, giving in to the, the way the semester is structured in terms of time. We thought of it as a kind of 15-week thing or 16-week thing. Um, but we tried to make that flexible by giving the students the ability to do the stuff whenever they wanted to do it, if they fit it in with a particular um, four-week process, or four-week period, I should say. And then the other thing that I think was really important is you know, because they are doing it online, and we, we can see there's art and there's drama and there's film. I mean, the possibilities become so much more in all, it just stuff that you can have students look at. So one of the things that I'm doing in the drama section is they're going to watch um, The Tempest. And they're going to, or they, have, they can watch The Tempest if they want to, one of, those, uh, one of those units. They can watch Waiting for Godot. In the music section, we're going to have them look at... Um, a Broadway production of Oklahoma starring Hugh Jackman, as weird as that might sound. Um, <laughs> but those are things you could never do face to face. It just w it wouldn't be possible, partly because, and again, this is, this is fair enough, you know, the students are thinking about time themselves, and they think about hours, and if you're three hours together in a room, well, that's three hours, you could really have them doing much more interesting stuff than just listening to me go on at 900 people, a bunch of whom are talking, a bunch of whom are buying shoes, a bunch of whom are making out, you know, whatever it is that they're doing. <laughs> so it just seems it's really kind of liberating in that way. But we wanted to be consistent. So if we were to go to the drama, you're going to see exactly the same kind of shape. We'll just say drama. There'll be different boxes. And it is a really kind of visual thing. Um, and kind of what's underpinning it all then for me, and this is the sort of, the great thing about the online is just that flexibility. One of the interesting things is it's really, I think, positively affected my face-to-face -face teaching of this course. So our, face, our old face-to-face -face section, like I said, was that huge thing. It was in the Kent. Well, we're still doing a face-to-face. -face, um, there is a, still a face-to-face -face option. It's capped at 150 students, which seems... Like, just nothing, you know, it really seems such a small number, which is great. 
and we do it in FAV um, 150, but it's had a really positive effect on, on, I've sort of thought through all sorts of stuff that I'm using in that class now as a consequence of doing the online. So one of the things, the class meets Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday afternoon, we never, or very rarely do we meet on a Friday afternoon. So Friday afternoon is given over to the students to do group stuff or other work in their own online um, section. So they're doing stuff like sharing um, art objects or talking about moves, whatever it might be. And it always seemed, you know, a part of me sort of was, I guess before I'd done the online thing, I'm not sure I'd have thought that was a perfectly appropriate or valid thing to do. Because, of course, what your impulse is, you've got to be in the room, you've got to be in the room. That's where the work takes place. Because that's not really where the work takes place. So those Friday spaces are really good consequence of that. Like I say, I do feel, maybe ambivalence is not the right word anymore. The, the thing about the online stuff is it, it is amazing. Canvas is incredible. These guys are incredible. But ultimately, depending on the circumstance, depending on the class, depending on what you're doing, it's a tool. Right? So Canvas is not going to solve our problems, just like sitting in a room with a bunch of people isn't. It's all about using the appropriate tools in the appropriate way. That's a cart before a horse, you see. So we can't think, okay, we'll just do everything through Canvas, because that, will, that will, will be perfect. It's perfect for some things, I think. And a big gen ed course like 1330, it's, it's really, really great. Um, I wouldn't necessarily want to do it if I was teaching a grad seminar on film theory. It seems that's a much more, you know, if you've got eight, nine people, it's a much more intimate place you can sit down and you can talk about stuff. That's it, thanks. Any questions? Just one quick question. Um, I like the way you came up with the modules and breaking it down. And since they're on their own, they've got to figure out when to do it. What do you do to encourage them not to put it off to the last moment? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's difficult to, to say anything to not to avoid that. I mean, they could make that choice. They have, like I said, that first week is kind of set. They've got to do the intro. Then they've got three weeks to do three modules. And they're aware of what the work is involved, but ultimately I don't know the answer to that question. I'm not sure I have one. The, they know the module will close, and then that's that. So other than... It, that, it comes down to the idea of self-discipline. They've got to discipline themselves, and I don't know, I don't know what the answer is to that. So... I, can I just quickly say something to that? I, I sometimes think that that's a certain learning style. Some people mm -hmm. really aren't going to perform unless they're under pressure. I, I went to grad school with several people who really had plenty of time, but didn't, they wouldn't, they didn't, they were inspired to perform until there was that pressure. So I don't know if it's inherently necessary unless you're experiencing students who are failing because their failure to plan is making them unable to submit Assignments on time. Yeah, I think, can I think just say one quick thing for your question? Uh, you know, when, and again, doing the face to face, because there were so many students, we would have really firm deadlines. So your paper's got to be in by 11 59 pm on the Friday night. And I would say to students, there's a whole bunch of you in here, I know what's going to happen. You're going to be trying to submit this at 11 58, the clock is going to turn, and it's going to shut you out. And I know what you're going to be doing. And then you can say to me, oh, but can I just? And the thing is, is this what I would say to them? Okay, so we'll say, all right, we'll, we, we'll, we'll make it 12.15 then. I know what you'll be doing. It will be 12.14 instead of 11.58. <laughs> so we'll make it one then. Okay, and then we'll just go on and on and on. So at some point, my feeling is where you've got to, and, and as Jen says, it is a kind of, there's different learning styles and people are do, choose, making choices about how they submit that work in, in individual ways. Yeah, I'm sorry. But if we have a, a module or whatever you want to call it that's three weeks long, what, one of the things that I do is have sort of what Jen was talking about with, with no pressure quizzes, you know, within that. Mm -hmm. And so they can take those as often as they want before the deadline, only the highest scores count. But what that does is give them the incentive not to wait till the last minute because their milestones 
that they have to achieve throughout that. And it, particularly in a class that's about two-thirds freshman, a large class, um, the first semester freshman may not have the discipline not to wait yeah. till the last minute and then try to cram three weeks of work into one night. I mean, when I was a freshman, I read 2,000 pages of Russian history in one night and made a B plus on the exam. Yeah. You know, and, and there are people in my class that will hedge that bet as much as they can. Yeah, I mean, I think that, I guess the only thing I could say is it, it, it's the, the course's description instructions are really clear. It's a 100 level course, so it's, it, it's pretty kind of standard. I, I don't want to use the term. It's what you would expect for a large class with, with, at that sort of level. Um, they have to do three units, right? They've got three units. Each unit has exactly the same. There's a consistency to the exercise. They have a discussion element. They have a consideration element. And what was the other one? An, an exam element. And so, some of those exams are quizzes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So some of the quizzes. And it's, it's, it's really clear. Everything is so crystal clear. And everything is so straightforward. And my feeling is... And again, I don't want to sound like I'm being brat grind, but my feeling is, well, if you do that, your first module, that's a really good learning experience for you. And if you do it in your second module, well, then that, that, that then really behooves you to think about what you're doing in this class. So it's, I, and I, but I think it's a really good idea. And, and again, this is the first year we've done it. So we're expecting all sorts of interesting things to come up to you. So. 520 maybe. And so when they do discussions, yeah. are they broken into canvas groups? Yeah, so okay. yeah, there, there's, what I've, again, so what I've tried to do, and it was really difficult to begin with, is not think of it as a class of 500 students. A, each group is what, maybe 20? Well, what, 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 with the discussions, they aren't broken into groups. But when you're considering the fact that each of these 500 students are choosing a different unit within mm -hmm. the module, they're all discussing together in specific groups because they're choosing those modules at different times and at the same time, if that makes sense. So we have a main introduction discussion where they're all discussing together. And then we have those units that they're choosing at different times and they're discussing yeah. together. So they are technically in groups, but it just depends yeah. on which unit they're choosing and when they're choosing but, to go in and do that discussion. And those groups just naturally select themselves as relatively small numbers, I think. Right. The so groups that we have put them in are alphabetical, and that's for the TAs, for the TAs to go yeah. in and, and grade them. Well, thank you. Well, let's give Dave the <laughs> Okay, our next presentation. Courtney Stewart used to count brine shrimp on the Great Salt Lake and measure fish on Strawberry Reservoir. Is that a Discovery Channel show? Yeah, cool. But then he de decided to become a middle and high school science and math teacher for the money. <laughs> he currently is a member of the Teal Department as an instructional leadership faculty. When not studying rural school leaders in the remote areas of um, Utah, he studies experiential outdoor education and online learning in environments. Prior to USU, he was faculty at the University of Montana as well as Minnesota State University Mankato within their education leadership departments. He lives with his wife and four kids in North Logan. And his pre presentation is described as, uh, in this presentation, Courtney will demonstrate the application of self-directed learning paths for students in online learning environments where content is provided for students in their choice of learning style. The presentation will also share how the Learning Path tool was used in a master's level online graduate course. Assignments were also designed to pair with the preferred learning style. The presentation will share how the course was created and implemented 
throughout an online Canvas semester. Important. Thank you. Let's see. Well, I'm excited to be with you today. Um, I, I want to echo the same sentiments as David. I feel like I'm not an excellent teacher at all. I'm just trying to make my life easier and my students' lives easier. So today I'm going to present um, what I call choice in online learning. But I know it's uh, 4.30. You're usually pro probably planning on heading home, getting some dinner ready doing all the things you want to do in the afternoon in the nice warm weather. So I'm going to engage with you today and see if I can get some talking points and see if you guys can give me a little insight as well. Um, but I'm going to kind of walk you through kind of the whole path that I took in developing this course and, and working with Travis and Kenneth in creating the learning path tool um, that's available in Canvas now. But I want to walk you through my thinking and how I kind of came and discovered that and realize what I wanted to do in, in creating this course. So I had a problem. I taught a master's level online asynchronous course to master's level students in our program, and I thought I was doing a great job. I had the PowerPoint, I made some videos, um, I had great assignments, lots of writing, and then I went in and started analyzing my data. And thanks to John Louvier, who gave me some Canvalytic tools, I went in and looked at the number of times students were viewing my PowerPoints. And I, they were good PowerPoints. They had videos and lots of bright colors and shiny, flashy words. Um, but I found out that in one of my classes in one semester, I had eight, eight views of this PowerPoint. I was like, that's not bad. I had 17 in the class, you know. But then I went back and I looked at unique views, and four of those eight were the same student. <laughs> So I was like, oh gosh, they're not engaging with the content. And why? Why aren't they engaging the content? Um, and so I did some self-reflecting and a lot of thinking. And, um, but I want to ask you, why? This is the why. Why do students or why do individuals choose to take an online course? What would be your response? Why take it online? Convenience. Convenience? They're working full-time. Working full-time? Out, out, out of state. Out of state, yep. Yeah, when I was in the University of Montana, I had a student in Zurich, Switzerland, and one in Russia. So there's some distance there. Convenience, out of state, other ideas, why take online? Save time, I think. Time, yeah. Yeah, I think you save time. It's the only option they have in that particular class that's required. Yeah. <laughs> and that was the case in this one. It was the only time it was offered is online that fall, and they elected to take it. So you guys, I came up with a lot of the same ones. Convenience. And this is one of the things that I focus on, is they can take it whenever. It's an asynchronous class. There's no requirement to be there at class. So if they're working, they can come and work till midnight, or they can get up at 3 in the morning and work. And they can do it wherever. They can do it at school. They can do it at home. They can do it at the library. That's the convenience factor. So that's why they choose and elect to take it for one of those reasons. And I came up with a second reason why they choose to take online courses. But it has to do with this. What do all these have in common? Wi-Fi? <laughs> Have it your way. Oh! <laughs> now, I kind of threw in two modalities there. There's some online, there's some internet versions there. So you can see the Netflix, Pandora, Hulu, Instagram, and Khan. But then I threw in the two food choices, and you nailed it. Burger King is Have It Your Way. What's chuck a slogan? The choice is yours. The choice is yours at chuck <laughs> So what do those have to do with Netflix, Pandora, Hulu, Instagram, Khan? You have a choice in the way you receive it. That's why people love Netflix. I can watch the next episode, the next episode, till it's 2 in the morning. I don't have to wait for commercials. I don't have to wait for it to air next week. Pandora, how does that benefit me? It tailors my learning preference. It tailors my choice of music. So by the end, I have an optimal stream that's playing just what I like because I can pick and choose. Instagram, I choose to who I follow, who I want to post to. Khan Academy, I can go in if I want to learn something. And that's overall. And I think that's the benefit and the, the draw of online. The internet itself is that we have the choice. No one tells us what we have to look at. No one has to tell us where we have to go. And so I came up 
with those two reasons, convenience and choice. And so I wanted to build that into my online class. So I kind of equated choice in a classroom to more of a, a formal construct of self-directed learning. Now, if, if you gave a kid a class whether or a, a student a choice in the classroom, would he choose to learn? Maybe not. Would he choose to stay in the classroom? If I kept him engaged. But I'm going to say self-directed learning. So I came up with this question, how can I incorporate self-directed learning into my classroom? How could I change online delivery to have more choice? Went to the literature. There's a lot of literature out there. And um, one of them shows that self-directed learning optimizes the learning experience. Doesn't make it better. Doesn't make their performance better. But it optimizes the experience. Okay, and I'd love to sit in David Wall's class. You know, I was enamored listening to him as he was talking there. That kind of engagement you want students to feel and to have, but this is optimizing the experience. So the second one was learner-centered instruction. There's some literature there um, that it is a solution in meeting a lot of the challenges of online learning. And so another one I didn't, I don't have on here is Bob Marzano. He talks about choice increases student engagement at every level. When you provide choice, students tend to engage. So I kept thinking, how could I incorporate? Let me briefly describe the class that I'm kind of basing this in. This is a graduate level master's class. It's TEAL 6280. The title is Instructional Strategies for the Diverse Learner. And when I say diverse here in, in, in the program um, sense here, it's diverse in different ways, not ethnically diverse, but diverse in the different modalities and different ways people learn. And so in our program, we prepare future principles. So we have pre-service principals, former teachers that know pedagogy, that know how to, to teach, that have been teaching for multiple years. Um, but the impetus for this class is to help future principals, help teachers, help all of their students. I know that's kind of uh, down the chain there, but that was the, the overall drive of the class. And it's about tailoring the instruction to meet the needs of every learner. So, and not only just the student, but also the teacher, because the teacher is a perpetual learner. If they're not learning, they're not improving their practice. So that was the class that I chose to focus on um, for this class. So let me ask you, what are some different ways that I can teach online? Asynchronously. What do you think? One of the things I found is that you can set up discussions. Okay. And the nice thing about online discussions is you're not limited to that 50 minute class period. Yeah. And so people can actually think about what they want to say. Right. They can go check references in my class. They can go um, read something that another student said in their paper and react to it. Mm -hmm. so discussions are actually richer for my classes online than they are in the classroom. Yeah, they have time to really re you know think on it and process it. In a classroom setting where we call on like grad grind, oh, tell me the answer A. You know, they don't have time to really process and think and to go read. And so that's a great example. Online discussions, chat rooms, those kind of things. Other ways that we can teach online. What do you guys think? You can, and people do often just take what they did in the classroom and convert it to PowerPoints with video. Yeah. Yeah, we can film uh, delivery of the PowerPoints and have it in narration. Um, you can use Camtasia, where you can have that voiceover talking over the PowerPoints. Um, but you can also go somewhere. Yeah. If you can afford the, the filming, you can go out into the field. You can go into an elementary school classroom. You can totally. go to an art museum to let you use lights. Yeah. And, and actually show people things and talk about them on your yeah, that's a great, great example. Other ways? What about podcasts? Can you do audio, provide it as a file they can download, put it on their phone, listen to it while they're driving to work or driving somewhere? Podcast is another option. What about project-based learning? Has anyone tried to utilize that in an online environment? Give them a project to go out and then discover or work on? So I do service learning. Yeah. And so they, you know, the students all have to find the service opportunity and do it and then the course material asks them to address the aspects of the service all the way through the semester. But they choose 
where they want to serve right. and how they, when they want to serve. Yeah, and that's another great example. Service learning is a powerful way to teach a concept as well. So I threw in the other question here, what are the different ways students can learn online? Um, I know for me, when I am online, I don't like to watch a video. And even when I have a video playing, I pull up another screen so I can just listen to it. Because I don't like to watch people talk. Because I think I either look at their lips or I look at the background. I have ADD, and so I can get distracted very easily with what's in their background instead of listening to them. I mean, there are other kind of videos rather than someone talking. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are animations of cellular processes, right. animations of... DNA replication, and so I use those kind of videos. Yeah. I'm not ever going to give them a video where I'm, I never appear in any video. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's exactly <laughs> what I did. I, I didn't want to show my face at all. <laughs> as enough. And that's great. And the animation part and diagrams is another type of learning that students can. So because of the class and the nature of this class, I wanted to, to create a modality of learning. And rather than having too many options, I, I based it on these four learning styles um, from the VARC. And I'm sure you've heard of the VARC. It's, ba it's uh, an acronym for visual, aural, which is auditory, read, write, and kinesthetic. And so I have to throw a caution here. There is literature that challenges the empirical validity of these learning styles and all learning styles. And so I just want to put that out there. Um, but I also throw in a little caveat there. Most learning is, is not well empirically validated. So I just want to throw that out there as well. Oh, I need to go back, sorry. Um, so I created these four different options for receiving instructions, and the students would then take this VARC, it was a questionnaire, because I don't know if the students knew their preferred learning style. So it was, it was basically a starting point. It was a point where they could begin and choose a modality. And a lot of them had never taken the VARC before and didn't know maybe a preference that they had to learning. So I built that into the course as well. Is the very first thing they would do is understand their preferred level of learning or delivery of learning. So I began to build the course. Um, and this is where I received an innovation grant from RCDE at the time uh, that provided some support from both city and some pay to pay time in creating essentially four different classes every module. I created a visual path. Um, I created a, an aural, read, write, kinesthetic path. So each week, each module would have four different deliveries that a student would elect to receive that material in. Um, based on their VARC score, they would then be suggested to take, if they scored high on the visual, they would take the visual modality. And you can see here, this is a screenshot from my class, and this is their ch their, their, where they would choose. It was, and I'll talk about it in a second, how we kind of grappled with creating this and building the course. Um, but other thing I built in there, which I, I, I don't have up here, is I built in a lot of what we we're talking about, these formative quizzes, no pressure quizzes. And it was kind of an impetus to help them understand the material before they moved on. And so this, they could take the quiz three times, and it was pass-fail. And every time, if they didn't pass, I encouraged them to go back and relearn the material in a different modality. Because maybe it wasn't optimal for them. Or maybe it wasn't optimal for them in learning that, that week's content. Um, and so then they would pass the test and move on. Another thing I built in is a classroom interaction activity. I called it the CIA. And so everyone had a chance every week to interact with someone in the class because I didn't want to lose that class culture. As you know, David was talking about, an online class doesn't really have a culture. Um, you don't have one like a face-to-face. -face. And I tried to recreate that by building class interaction activities. They would partner up. They would have debates. They would have discussions. Um, they would record audio responses or video responses and share it with other classmates. They got to know their students, at least in that form. Another thing I built in was choice in their assessment. So I'd give multiple options, and they could choose which assessment they wanted to show that they had learned that week's concept. Um, the first thing I would recommend is they could present it back in the way they learned it. So if they were in the visual path, I would ask them to record a video or create a diagram and share it with me of their learning that week. So again, they would have a chance to relearn um, and submitting it back to me. Same with uh, read, write, and oral. They would submit it back in both written form or a podcast form back to me. 
And I would actually even extend that further, and in grading those, I would respond in the same manner that they submitted it to me. So if they did an audio response to me, I would respond in grading with an audio file. And students loved it, actually. So that was the building of the course and building of the class. Um, you're probably asking what kinesthetic is. Does anyone know what kinesthetic pathway is? Yeah, it's physical, it's building, it's hands-on. You're like, wait, this is an online class. How did they do kinesthetic in this class? This was the one where I gave them the academic freedom. And this was a relinquishing of control. But I gave them the points that I wanted them to learn. I gave them a list and prompting questions. And I said, have at it. Go to the research. Go to a textbook. Go online. Go in your school. Go interview someone. Go observe a classroom. And I put all of the onus on them to learn that concept. And then in their, per their performance to me, their assessment, I would have them share what they saw. Take a video of someone enacting this strategy. Uh, make a, I had them create PDFs of a brochure announcing a professional development coming up. Um, and so those were ways that they could show uh, me that they learn. So that's how I incorporated it into the classroom. So almost out of time. Uh, just for the future and some of the results, this, I'm still teaching this class and still refining it and getting suggestions and help. But that first semester, my teacher evaluations, the idea evaluations jumped. They jumped by 10 points. And I wasn't bad before. I was in the similar range in the 50s, but I went up into the 60s. And that was unheard of for me in an online class to see that kind of gain. There wasn't one negative comment. Everyone loved the class. And I don't know if it was a new experience for them or why. And I'm still trying to figure that out. But students overwhelmingly enjoyed just the choice in, in receiving their delivery. And they were encouraged to try every different type of delivery. Um, and I would actually track for me and for research purposes, every time they made a change, they had to fill out a questionnaire that said, why are you changing? And so I was able to track them and for understanding why they were changing from reading to kinesthetic. And we looked at a lot of data, uh, Travis and Megan Lewis, who's also uh, works over at City, City um, have helped me analyze that data and understand the actions of the students and how they were interacting in the course. So engagement improved. Um, and then one thing that I wanted to emphasize is that it was choice rather than a preference. I didn't want to tailor and tell them they had to learn in one modality, but I wanted to give them the option. So that's it. Any questions? Questions? Thoughts? I take feedback too. So in your development of your course, you essentially developed it four, four times. Yeah. Four, four different ways. I cheated a little. And the way I cheated was is when I was doing my visual modality, I would record an audio file and separate that out so they could just listen to my discussion. And that would take, you know, two, two flies with one swat kind of thing that way. But yeah, essentially it was a lot of legwork in creating these courses. And I don't necessarily you know, encourage that for everybody, um, but this was kind of a, a pilot for me, and I had some help from RCDE to do that. So did you come up with, you had a list of things that you could do for audio, a list of things you could do for visual, and then you're able, or did you just have activities, and you say, okay, I think this is going to go here, or this is you know, do you see what I'm saying? How did you come up with the four distinct paths for them to learn and know that you were covering the same information? So what I did is, in working with city folks, I took each... I had taught this class before, so I had every day that I had taught that class, and I had the PowerPoints, and I had... And so I went through and identified all the key concepts I wanted them to walk away with. The good to know. It was almost like the layered curriculum that Jen was talking about. The, the essentials to know. And then the good to know is I kind of went on that way. And I went through and took each modality and said, what would be the way of learning visually with this concept? What would the audio, you know, and I just usually took a podcast of that, read and write, and then kinesthetic. And so I would brainstorm each of the modalities based on that foundational material that it already taught. Did you find out that variety was, I mean, did you try to do different things so that they weren't doing the same thing? Do you know what I'm saying? Like the same thing for visual, they're all just 
Yeah, essentially, visual, audio, read, write were very similar. Kinesthetic was always something very different because I really opened and let them choose how to learn that way. And one thing I, I want to talk about in working with Travis, you know, and Kenneth, we really problem solved because rather than creating four online Canvas courses, um, Kenneth was a genius and came up with this cookies-based learning tools. Um, and you, you can talk to him. It's, still, it's accessible to anybody, but it, once they choose a preference, they remember that the cookies remember that choice. And so every time they come back, it shows them that preference. And so if they were to switch, it just resets the cookies. So it was brilliant. And just so you know, that same learning path is what we use in David's course. It's just not... But, you know, it's not yeah. out by visual. I think it's just that they're choosing that, but it's the same thing. Yeah, and I, I elected to make those four learning styles. But. With the, the kinesthetic option, how do you, what's your process of assessment? So in terms of the criteria for a mark or a grade, and maybe it's different if it's, if it's masters, but you know, something that I think is not an unusual experience is for students say, what? What exactly is it that you want me to do in order that I can get an A, right? Or it might be. Yeah. So when something is, because that's really fascinating, but something is sort of, um, I don't know, loose is the right word, but you know what I mean? So it's loose. It is loose, does, yeah. How does that work? So what I did is I created a rubric that fits every modality. And these were the core things that I would look for in an assessment, whether it's visual, audio, written, or kinesthetic. So they knew the foundational things that I was looking for in an assessment. Um, but with the kinesthetic, and a lot of them, I get questions all the time, you know, in the, what are you looking for? I don't know what you're looking for. And so they have a hard time with that freedom as well. Um, by the second or third time, they know what I was looking for. And a lot of times, it was them going out, and they would actually invest more time in learning. And they'd spend more time talking to teachers. And I'd get better products in the kinesthetic than I would in the reading and writing. Because cranking out one and a half pages is no problem weekly. But going in and interviewing two teachers or videotaping a class took a lot more time and investment. But it is, and it is loose, and it's intentionally loose. And I, I'm kind of the BS filter. Like, I'm like, I can call BS and say, oh, you're just submitting garbage, versus, wow, this is quality work. And with master students, you can do that. I don't know, undergrad would be very difficult in that sense, I think. Thank you. Thank you again. Let's give a round of applause to all three of our presenters again. Thank you all for coming uh, this afternoon. We'll have these again posted on our web site. We'll plan on seeing um, you all as well as your colleagues on October 28th. And for those of you here on the Logan campus, please take a cookie before you, you leave. And uh, thank you again. Have a great evening.